Hello and welcome to the second day of our Planoa Virtual Symposium. I hope you have enjoyed the virtual show as well as the talks of yesterday. And looking forward for another exciting day with question and discussions. Um, to myself, my name is Matitas Kandasami, Senior Product Manager based in Cologne, Germany and working for the European Bioprocess Division. We will start the section today with robust biomanufacturing and I am also pleased to welcome Uwe Gottschalk who will be chair this section. So, good to see you, Uwe. Hope you're doing well Hi. and safe. <laughs> Hi. So, I will start with the introduction of Uwe. Dr. Uwe Gottschalk is the chief um, officer at Lonsa since July 2017. Between uh, 2014 and 2017, he served as the chief technology officer where he established and leads the global research technology organization of Lonsa. Before joining Lonza, he served as group vice president at Sartorius between 2004 and 14 with global responsibility of all bioseparation uh, related process technology. Uwe earned his MSc and PhD in uh, chemistry at University of Münster, Germany at Nottingham, UK, delivering his di dissertation on drug target with monoclonal antibodies. In academia, Dr. Goldcheck is currently the head lecturer at University of Duisburg Essen in Germany, and also the lecturer of Ecole Polytechnique Federation at Lausanne in Switzerland. He is honorary member of the Society of Biochromatography and non-separation member of management pool at the Institute of Marketing, University of St. Gaon, and a member of American Chemical Society. So, before I hand link to Uwe, if you have any questions and comments, you can write it in the chat. We will address it during the uh, Q&A section. If I should miss some question during, uh, due to the short time, we will get back to you afterward. So, I'm handling to you, you Uwe. Thank you very much, Matitas, for the kind introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of Azai Kaze, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second day of the 2021 Planova EU Virtual Symposium and to Session C that I am co-chairing with Matitas. Uh, the topic of our session is robust biomanufacturing and during the last months we have all acknowledged and appreciated that amidst the pandemic that we witnessed, the biotech community was uh, actually becoming part of the solution because of a clear focus on supply chain continuity for vaccines and for therapeutics, and of course, with no compromise on quality. The basis for all of that are scientists like us across the world working around the clock uh, to create robust processes with coordinated efforts across and between government authorities, academia, and the whole industrial biotech community with small and large companies. I am proud to be part of this community and um, as well part of this symposium, which has a long tradition and as much I, as I would have liked to meet all of you in person today, I'm very happy that you are here with me and uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you all face to face at the next symposium. With no further ado, let me announce then the first speaker of our session, Daniel Strauss. Uh, Daniel leads the research and development group at uh, Azai Kaze uh, Bioprocess America in Glenview, Illinois, as an R&D director. He focuses on providing data to better understand the capabilities and lim limitations of Planova virus filters and on providing solutions to improve the ability of customers to provide safe biotherapeutic products to their patients. Danny received a PhD in biochemistry uh, from the University of Boulder, Colorado in 2005. Uh, he then completed his postdoc research in the virus clearance group at Genentech 
And um, then he worked as a research um, scientist in the viral clearance group at Eli Lilly uh, to start with um, Azai Kaze back in 2012. He is a member of ACS and PDA, and he is very active uh, in the MAST Center and BioForum. So, Danny, over to you. So, with this, we will go to the first talk of today's section. Hi, I'm Daniel Strauss. I'm the R&D director at Asahi Kasei Bioprocess America. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my European colleagues for organizing this uh, virtual symposium and for inviting me to speak. I'd also like to thank all of the attendees for taking the time out of your busy days to attend. Uh, of course, uh, you know, a virtual symposium is nothing like the, uh, the you know, the face-to-face -face conference, uh, but I, I do hope that, you know, soon we'll be able to raise a glass of sake together and until then, I do hope that uh, uh, all of you can at least come away from, from this having learned something today. So uh, with that, I will uh, start to talk about uh, the virus filtration life cycle, in particular, uh, some of the big changes which happen as you go from early stage process development all the way up to your commercial scale manufacturing process. Of course, the biggest difference is the change in scale going from small scale filters running, say, 100 milliliter uh, type processes up to uh, many meters squared uh, filter running, you know, multiple thousands of liters of processes, uh, but also changes on uh, working in a, you know, fairly informal laboratory type setting uh, where your biggest concern is probably the limited material you have to work with. Uh, moving into, uh, you know, strict GMP manufacturing facility uh, where your biggest concern is likely the limited footprint you have to operate your, your manufacturing um, process. Uh, and then of course, in addition to these basic considerations, uh, as we look towards the biomanufacturing factory of the future, there are many other things which, uh, which people are thinking about these days. Uh, a lot of different new uh, strategies for implementing those, those processes. Uh, some of the uh, you know, similarities between these things in general, everybody would like to have greater productivity uh, with smaller footprints and smaller capital costs. Uh, there's a need for more flexible and adaptive manufacturing suites. Uh, and then there's a strong drive towards integration of single use and continuous processing into, uh, into all unit operations. Of course, what this means for virus filtration is that uh, the, the large stainless steel tanks uh, that we have generally used for constant pressure or um, processes uh, are going away to some degree. And uh, there's more of a move towards using pumps for virus filtration, um, either coming out of a single use bag or a continuous process going directly into a pump and then running the filter that way. Uh, so some basic considerations which need to occur, of course, is the pump type, because there are a number of different kinds. Um, and of course, the control strategy, because with the pump, you have the option of running either in constant pressure as we have um, you know, previously or running in constant flow. Uh, but as you dig into the details, of course, there are many other considerations that you need to uh, think about uh, when you're implementing a pump-based system. Of course, with the pump itself, you have different um, tubing sets, connections, sensors, different single use components, as well as the calibration of the pump itself. Uh, but then within the control strategy, uh, there's, there's more of a need for automation. Uh, there are some differences in the uh, operation which can occur, such as pressure ramp up and pressure fluctuations that happen coming um, when you're using a pump. Uh, and then of course, the, the integrity test strategy uh, can be somewhat different uh, in implementing a pump. Uh, so there's a lot to think about here. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of these. Of course, we've been looking at, uh, you know, a number of those factors to make sure that they aren't going to uh, introduce some problems as people start to use pumps more. Uh, a couple of things I'll talk about, specifically uh, Planova scalability using pumps, uh, the effect of pressure fluctuation um, on virus filtration, and the effect of a pressure ramp up uh, at the beginning and during uh, runs using a pump. Uh, now, before I go on, there are some, uh, some basic details to all of the uh, uh, experiments I'll talk about. Generally, the study conditions that I'll be presenting are using a Planova 20N filter uh, with you know, basic protein concentration of about one to five grams per liter BSA, nothing very special here, uh, very uh, basic neutral buffer. Uh, we are spiking some virus, um, either PPV for those cases where we can, um, but PP7 we had to use, uh, it's a, a small uh, bacteriophage. Uh, that we need to use for the scalability work because of some of the volumes and, and uh, uh, processes that we're running there. Uh, throughputs are generally 100 to 200 liters per meter squared. So these are very, very basic kind of conditions uh, for the studies that we'll be using. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about is the pump scalability. Uh, and um, 
basically with this, we wanted to evaluate the scalability of 20N using pump filtration process to demonstrate that there's no impact across the different scales of filters uh, when you're using a pump. So what we did was basically used a couple of different pumps uh, on different size filters, ranging from two of the smallest scales of filter to two of the largest scales of filter. And we had some special filters manufactured uh, from the same spinning series, so we don't have differences amongst them. Uh, and we implemented a constant flux process, basically where we have a, a pump driven system coming out of a couple of different tanks. We do have two tanks here, one for the protein solution, one for the buffer, um, so that we can switch from the feed to the buffer without having a pause in the process. Um, and we spiked all these runs with PP7. Um, and uh, basically to jump to the data, I'm showing here permeability uh, of the uh, filtration across the different scales. Uh, across the different or across the throughput of each of these runs. Uh, and, and what you're seeing here is basically how much uh, flow we get for a given amount of pressure. Uh, and what you can see by the data is that we don't get a lot of variation um, across the different scales uh, as we run these by pump. Um, and you can see the, the permeability is fairly constant for this run or these runs. Um, and very consistent across different scales. Uh, we do see a little bit of spread and the range that we see is fairly consistent with the validation data that we get for water flux um, on our filters. So this is kind of a normal type of variability that we expect to see. Uh, so this demonstrates that Planova 20N filters provide consistent performance across the scales. Uh, but of course, one important thing is how does the viral clearance look? Uh, and so we did that using PP7 bacteriophage. You can see that we get very good viral clearance above four logs for all of the different uh, filter sizes when operated with a pump. Uh, the open circles here are complete clearance. We do get a little bit of virus breakthrough in a couple of cases, um, but we still get very robust clearance in, in all cases. Uh, and the, the uh, viral clearance we get here is very consistent with the viral clearance that we got on a previous study where we were looking at viral clearance with pressure across the different scales. So overall, we really see that Planova 20N provides consistent viral clearance across the scales, whether you're operating with a pump or with pressure. Uh, but an important thing here is that this seems to demonstrate that the small scale virus filtration experiments are representative of large scale processes. And that's really critical because of course, we don't wanna do all of our experiments at full you know, one meter and four meter squared scale. So we wanna understand that our small scale processes are in fact representative. Um, and that kind of leads into the next couple experiments I'll talk about, which are done at small scale. Uh, so another thing we wanted to look at was the effect of pressure fluctuation. Of course, when you're operating a filter with a pump, especially peristaltic pump, you can get uh, significant um, fluctuations of pressure as the, um, as the pump heads turn. Uh, and so we wanted to evaluate whether or not pressure fluctuation would have an impact. Uh, we did this by setting up a system where we had very exaggerated pressure ranges, so larger than what you would normally see with a, with a well-optimized process. Uh, we used a peristaltic pump, um, and we basically used a four-roller head, uh, either one or two of these heads, but we used tubing, which was fairly oversized for this. And this really increases the amount of uh, um, pressure fluctuation that you get. Normally with these processes, we'd be running at about a one, millim uh, one millimeter ID. So these, this is quite a bit bigger than, uh, than what we would normally be using. Uh, and of course, we measure uh, pressure every two seconds, so quite, quite often on this, so that we can really see the fluctuation. Uh, the pressure curve that we get looks like this. Of course, it's a big mess, if you will. But if we kind of zoom in on this, you can actually see that there's a fluctuation of pressure um, caused by the, the turning of the pump heads. And the range that we're getting here is on the order of about 0.6 bar. Um, so it's, it's a pretty significant range in this case. Uh, this is one of the one head runs. If we use two heads, this decreases. And so we actually have quite a bit of control um, as to what the um, average pressure is and also what this range is in this study. Um, and so you can see here that with uh, a couple of different runs with different target pressures and different um, amounts of fluctuation, with the one pump head, we can get very significant uh, changes in pressure. With the two pumps head, two pump heads, we can get much smaller uh, fluctuations, but then we can control where those fluctuations are occurring. Uh, some of these runs we did um, slightly above the maximum transmembrane pressure for Planova 20N um, to test kind of worst case conditions. Uh, some of these we, we performed at kind of a low range of pressure for Planova 20N. So we really were able to, uh, to hone this in and, and look at some different conditions. 
Uh, to make a long story short, we got very good PPV um, or parvovirus clearance across all these different runs, regardless of the pressure fluctuation. So here you can see LRVs um, above four in all cases. Uh, we actually had complete clearance in most cases with one exception here. Um, this being a case where we had somewhat low pressure, um, and we think that low pressure is probably a, a bigger impact on viral clearance than the pressure fluctuation. And so what we see is that uh, we do see very consistent PPV clearance on all the filtrations with very robust LRVs above 4.6 for all the runs. Um, and these pressure fluctuations did not negatively impact any of the virus removal capability. Um, so that's very good. It shows the robustness of the Planova 20N filter and using pumps under challenging conditions. Um, but there's another condition which, which came up, um, one of our customers asked us about, um, which is an extended ramp up time during a, a pump based uh, filtration. And basically when you have a, a constant pressure filtration using a feedback control, uh, so an automated system which, which measures transmembrane pressure and matches the flow rate to uh, have a constant pressure filtration, it takes a little while before that system gets up to the constant pressure condition. Um, and that can result in basically a period of time where the pressure is ramping up before it gets up to the target. Um, and so we wanted to mimic that. Um, so our goal was to uh, evaluate the effects of this pressure ramp up using 20N filters. Um, so basically we wanted to, to set up something like this where we have a study where the pressure ramps up over time, hits a target and then stays there. And then we uh, have a pause prior to another ramp up and then a, uh, a buffer recovery flush. Um, so that was our goal. Um, at first, we started looking at whether or not we could do this with a pump. Um, and what we found out was it really was very difficult to, to control uh, this with a pump-based system without having a fully automated system, which we don't have. Um, and so we ended up going back and realizing we could execute this with a manual pressure ramp. Uh, and so what we actually did was we, we set up our, our system. It's a you know, fairly simple system here but we have two different pressure regulators leading into our feed vessel. Um, and so what we, and this is a three-way valve here. So what we did was we basically altered from one regulator to the other. So while one of the regulators was in line, we then could adjust the pressure on the other regulator to ramp it up. And then every one minute, basically, we, we went from one regulator to the other, increasing the pressure with each of those switches. Um, and by doing that, we were able to get not, not a, a continuous ramp up, I guess, but, uh, you know, more of a, a kind of step-based um, ramp up, but something very similar um, to what would happen with a fully automated system. Uh, the data that we got looks like this. This is showing basically, uh, you know, we have a, a um, in this case, a constant pressure. When we don't have any ramp up, uh, we have a pause, um, but then we're able to just turn it right back on. Um, if we do have a ramp up, uh, this is a five minute ramp up. You can see that it takes a bit um, for the pressure to ramp up. Uh, you also can see that the flux ramps up as the pressure increases, as you'd expect. Uh, we have a pause and then another ramp up after that. And again, the flux ramps up here. Um, now with the, the quick ramp up, we see a relatively linear increase in the amount of volume in our filtrate. Um, whereas if we have a lengthy ramp up, this is a 30 minute ramp up, you can see there's kind of a, a gradual increase in the uh, uh, the filtrate um, accumulation, as you'd expect for a process which is going through this kind of lower pressure condition. Um, so these are the studies we did. We did a couple of these using different, um, different target pressures, different um, uh, pause times, and different ramp up times, as you see here. Um, and again, we saw very good, robust clearance from the Planova 20N filter. Um, so under all the different conditions, different pause times, up to 90 minutes, different ramp up times up to 30 minutes. Uh, we saw complete clearance in all of the filtrate pools and all of the uh, recovery flush pools. Uh, so we got LRVs um, really above four across the board, but with complete clearance in all cases. Um, so it does seem like an extended ramp up time did not impact the virus removal capabilities of the Planova 20N filter. And so uh, we think that, you know, with a pump based system that has, you know, some fluctuation, some pump ramp up, uh, that doesn't seem to impact the overall robustness of the process. Um, so what, you know, in summary, we see that Planova 20N provides a highly robust performance when operated by a pump. So there's really no concerns um, once you have a, you know, a good process. Uh, we see consistent performance at all of the scales. You, when using a pump, no impact due to pressure fluctuations and pump ramp up. Um, so really, you know, as I say by our process, uh, you know, we are ready to support biomanufacturing 
at all scales for the processes of today and those of tomorrow. Uh, you know, so bring on your, your toughest, um, you know, most interesting processing strategies, we'll be able to take care of it. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who actually did this work. Um, Brian Busing uh, was, was uh, basically led the pump scalability work. Uh, Victoria Kaloudis led the uh, pump fluctuation work. Daniel Franco led the, uh, uh, the pump ramp up and figured out that nice innovative scheme to uh, manually have a, a uh, you know, gradual pump ramp up, um, which was really nice work. Um, and of course, some other members who uh, supported both in the lab and also in management. Um, and with that, uh, I would just like to say thank you again for attending, and I will, I guess, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Great talk. So we have already two questions. Um, the first question is, hi, Daniel, do you plan to perform similar studies with Planot by EX? Uh, yes, yes. So th those are uh, in, in the plans. Uh, we haven't started those yet, but uh, we definitely have gotten lots of uh, requests for that. I know uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of movement towards BioEx. BioEx can be a little bit trickier uh, in running uh, some of the pump studies at higher pressures, especially with peristaltic pump. Um, but yeah, those, those studies are in the works. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, the conditions 98 kilopascal or less is suggested for Planoa 20 and use? Um, sorry, I don't, yeah, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, geez, from your presentation, at most uh, 18 PSI can be used. Oh, uh, you know, we we recommend 14 PSI, which is one bar or 98 kilopascal. Um, so that is the maximum uh, transmembrane pressure for uh, for Planova 20 n So we do some of our studies at ranges above that, um, but. Uh, that's really just, uh, you know, intended to uh, to make sure that we have very robust processes. Uh, we would not recommend customers to to use uh, pressures above above that limit. Okay, so uh, maybe the last question from CSL Bering: Did you also investigate the impact of pressure fluctuation on LRV at the pressure significant below low pressure limit? Uh, we were operating right about the, the low pressure limit. So uh, with, with Planova 20N, um, if you get much below about 0.5 bar, then you, you can get uh, um, more uh, impacts on, on viral clearance. And, and then it really does start to depend a little bit more on the specific product you're working with and the, uh, the conductivity and, and the pH and such. So uh, we had operated kind of right at that level, but we didn't want to go too low. Uh, you know, our, our intent really was to see how those pressure um, pressure fluctuations impact um, things uh, under under relatively normal conditions. Um, I will say we have done some other studies looking at continuous processes where we have operated at lower uh, lower pressures and lower fluxes, um, but we have we have not intentionally um, it, like done these exaggerated pressure fluctuation studies under those conditions. Okay, thank you, Danny. Um, maybe you will, you might also have some questions for Danny. No, uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, I think um, uh, your presentation fit the motto of robust biomanufacturing um, with regard to the data that you shared. Uh, so impressive. Um, my, my only uh, question would be if you're concerned um, of uh, pulsations from those pumps that you are using. What about uh, using more than two pump heads? Would that be an additional uh, relief? Yeah, I mean, generally, uh, you know, just from a, uh, you know, control strategy in a, in a GMP facility, you want to reduce that fluctuation. Obviously, you want to have as much control of your process as you can. Um, adding more pump heads will will certainly uh, uh, improve the, the, those fluctuations in terms of decreasing the, the pressure impact. Uh, and, and there are you know, pumps on the market that use as many as eight um, heads. Uh, so there, there's definitely a, a you know, kind of a push towards reducing that fluctuation. Uh, there are also, uh, you know, I mentioned there's different types of pumps which are, which are in use. It's not just peristaltic pumps at this point. Um, and there's definitely a lot of interest in some of those other pump types, in part because they do um, uh, alleviate the pressure fluctuation that can happen. So. 
Okay, there's one more question came in. So that is the last question for you, Danny. Would you really expect okay. a different outcome when using the BIEX? Are the data transferable? I, I would not expect a different outcome. Um, BioEX uh, has very highly robust um, viral clearance. Um, and I, I would not expect that any of the conditions that we're testing here would have any impact on viral clearance on BioEX. Uh, now, having said that, of course, we have to do the experiment and gather the data. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would not expect BioEX would have any trouble with these conditions. OK, with this, thank you for your talk. Great talk, great to have you Thank here. You. Yeah. you can hear Thank the virtual applause for you, and then we will move to the second speaker of today's section. So, Uwe, I'm again handling to you. Yeah, and we will see whether uh, those uh, favorable data are confirmed also um, in uh, the case study that Audrey Cousinet will um, now present. Uh, she is head of downstream process development at uh, GTP Biologics, which is part of Fareva, and she's there since 2008. As a um, and and her background is uh, biotechnology engineer. She graduated from the famous school of uh, ENSTBB in Bordeaux, I guess, uh, with uh, Xavier Santarelli. And um, she brings a strong background in bioprocess development, especially DSP, of course, for MAPs, for recombinant proteins, for ADCs. Her expertise also covers small scale process development, scale up bioprocess transfer to GMP production. And she managed several viral clearance studies with external partners since her organization is a, a CDMO. Uh, she has been working in the space for more than 13 years in close relation with uh, GMP facility, leading her to acquire broad experience of all GMP associated challenges and tricky situations, providing her a great know-how in troubleshooting. And uh, the case study she brings is uh, also um, on um, the implementation of Planova 20N in a process, and uh, um, she will tell us more. Uh, welcome, Audrey. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Audrey. And now we will move to the second talk of today's section. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to present you today uh, our work performed at GTP Biologics to integrate a Planova 20N nanofilter in a CDMO process development project in the risk mitigation approach for viral clearance with a non-GLP pre-study. So I first give you an overview, a quick overview of GTP biologics and explain the context of the study. And then we will go through technical considerations with a filterability assessment and the virus clearance studies uh, followed by a, a short conclusion. So GTP, GTP biologics is a relatively new player in the CDMO field. We are based in France at Swiss border near Geneva. And historically, an antibody bio production unit was built in 2011 by Pierre Fab Group. Uh, and in uh, 2019, Pierre Fabre decided, decided to launch uh, CDMO activities. Uh, and we started offering our bio production capacities to customers. So from process development, to uh, clinical manufacturing, including quality control and uh, all the support. Uh, recently, the bioproduction entity was uh, acquired by uh, Fareva, a French group, and we are now uh, integrated in a global uh, offer called uh, GTP BioWay CDMO, which covers from cell line development to fill and finish. We come back to uh, our case study. So our customer came to us with its monoclonal antibody and our objective was to develop the process and produce for a phase one uh, clinical stage. So we worked on a classical uh, CHO sales process using uh, platform DSP steps. And uh, we'll look more in detail uh, in this nanofiltration uh, step design. So this project was run with three, three key drivers uh, in mind to reach the objective of first GMP batch success and IND filing on time. So the main driver for the customer and for us as a CDMO uh, was the short timelines. 
So to perform this schedule, uh, the GLP viral clearance studies were planned in parallel of GMP batch. So at risk, if one step appears to fail in validation study. And to add some complexity, this project was run in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. So we've been uh, facing a lot of supply tensions uh, with uh, bioprocess raw materials, including uh, filters. Uh, so the availability of the nanofilter was really uh, a key parameter for, for our project. After timelines uh, comes uh, quality. Uh, even with a fast uh, development, we need to set up a reliable and robust nanofiltration step in terms of uh, filterability, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, virus uh, removal. And then uh, nanofiltration cost also play, uh, plays a key role in the process. So the, set, the step should be as uh, effective as possible and should require a fast implementation with a limited number of trials. So how did we proceed to implement quickly Planova 20N? We began the work with filterability assessment of Planova 20N compared to BioX using purified material uh, from the Ananion exchange step. MAP concentration was set at nine gram per liter, so high enough to have uh, reasonable volumes to treat in, uh, in GMP batches. For the scale down, uh, small devices of 10 square centimeters were used with prefiltration on a P PES membrane uh, 0 0.22 micron. Filtrations were run at constant pressure and the VMAX methodology was used to monitor the, the filtration runs. So filtered volume is registered a long time and the equation shown here enables to determine the uh, maximum volume that can be filtered uh, before clogging. So the VMAX. So here is the plot of the two filtrations performed on Planova Bio X at two bars in uh, orange and Planova 20N at one bar in uh, blue. So with BioX, we see a progressive decrease of flow rate with still one third of initial flow rate at the end of the, at the, end of the experiment. And with Planova 20N in blue, um, the flow rate decrease was uh, less important and a higher volume uh, could be uh, filtered. Uh, 185 liter per square meters with only 50% flow rate decrease, so quite better than uh, BioX. This slide uh, shows you the, the same experiments as uh, previously, but represents the plot corresponding to the Vmax equation. So here we plot time divided by volume on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. With this representation, you can also quickly see the difference of behavior of the two filters. The slopes of uh, each curve is directly linked to the Vmax. Uh, in fact, it is inversely proportional uh, to, uh, to the Vmax. So this is the usual way for us to compare filterabilities of nanofilters. So Planova 20N had a Vmax above 700 liter per square meters and BioX only 370 liter per square meters. So at this stage, we decided to keep Planova 20N run at one bar for our manufacturing process. Before going to scale up, we evaluated the impact of prefiltration of the MAB. In the first experiments, prefiltration was performed offline uh, as it is the case uh, as well during GLP validation uh, experiments. But during manufacturing, uh, the, um, the pre-filter is put in line with Planova. So it is really important to, uh, to check if pre-filtration configuration uh, can impact the filterability of Planova 20N. And secondly, to, it's important to define the required surface of uh, pre-filter. So we performed the trial and we compared the filterability curves between offline and inline prefiltrations. Uh, the curves uh, had similar slopes and the resulting VMAX were very close. So the online prefiltration, uh, the, the online prefiltration uh, the, does not impact filterability. It was run with a prefilter uh, uh, which was uh, 0 0.45 uh, times uh, lower in surface than the nanofilter. So this ratio uh, was kept at the minimum surface ratio to be used uh, for further batch modelizations. 
Before manufacturing of the GMP batch, uh, scale-up runs were performed on larger filters, so 0.01 square meters and 0.3 square meters. Flow rate decrease was limited during these scale-up runs and in good correlation with the first small-scale uh, modelizations. With all this data, we made the modelization and the sizing for GMP batches. So at that time, the forecast for the GMP run was uh, about a 120 liter to be filtered on Planova 20N. So depending on the area selected for GMP uh, batch, the filtration time is impacted, of course, but uh, also the, the cost of the filtration. So a filtration surface of two square meters uh, was chosen for our first GMP batch in order to limit filtration duration and to better, suit, uh, to better fit with uh, our GMP suite uh, organization. And at the end, in uh, real conditions, uh, the, the GMP nano filtration uh, step was executed in, uh, in 90 minutes. Uh, so in good correlation with all the sizing trials that we, we, were, we, uh, we had performed before. So good sizing and filterability are essential criteria for the performance of a nano filtration run in GMP. But one important thing also to keep in mind is the viral clearance efficiency of a step. And this depends on uh, filter sizing and uh, also on uh, GLP validation uh, study design. A good design of a viral clearance study is a key factor to ensure the success of the validation, but also to limit the GLP study cost and to collect enough data to secure the process. So when came, when came time to define viral clearance study, we had uh, several questions. For our project, the target load was around 60 liter per square meters in GMP batches. Um, so usually validation, uh, validation is performed under worst case conditions. So our objective here was to consider a worst case uh, load of uh, 120 liter per square meter to have some safety margin and flexibility. Another question uh, was about the storage temper temperature of the test item. So the map uh, presented some tendency to aggregate uh, when stored for a long time at uh, five degrees. So we were worried about the storage and shipment of the test uh, item samples to the virus, to the virus clearance CRO. And uh, we were worried about the probable impact of uh, aggregation and nanofiltration. So freezing the, the test item before spiking was considered as a solution, uh, but without any idea uh, of uh, the, the impact of freezing on filterability and virus removal. So after discussion with, uh, with ASAI, we, we worked in close collaboration with Virusure Laboratory uh, to define a non-GLP uh, study using uh, only uh, the, the smallest uh, model virus, so MVM, in order to answer those, uh, those questions before the GLP study and thus to better target the, the, the scope of the GLP study. So at Virusure, uh, MVM was spiked uh, in our test item, either stored at uh, five degrees or minus 20 degrees, and the load equivalent to around uh, 11 low TCD 50 per square meters was uh, evaluated. So 120 liter per square meters were uh, filtered uh, with an intermediate process pause and a second process pause before buffer flush. Uh, in order to mimic uh, some uh, potential technical stops in the process, because we know that these process pauses could have uh, detrimental effects on, uh, on virus uh, leakage. So here are the results of uh, this non-GLP study performed at Virusia. So progressive flow rate decrease was observed for, uh, for both conditions with a similar behavior between cold storage or freeze for uh, storage of the test item. So this was the first uh, good news. Um, each test item was packed so around uh, 11 log TCD 50 per square meters. And uh, in both conditions, cold or freeze or cold or frozen, uh, we, we didn't, didn't see any impact uh, on the log reduction value. The nano filtration was efficient with some MVM leakage observed in the filtrate but maybe due to either process pause or total load on the filter. 
Nevertheless, log reduction value was still uh, high and above uh, nine, above uh, four. So this non-GLP study uh, for us was very uh, helpful to better define uh, the GLP uh, study design and to increase the chance of success for the of a GLP study. So we adapted a little the GLP study design. We confirmed the storage at minus 20 degrees for the test items uh, before spiking at the GLP zero. We kept only uh, one process pause during the filtration experiments, uh, one pause before buffer flush because it reflects uh, what is done in the GMP manufacturing. For MVM ratio, spiking ratio, we checked with the, the CRO that the spike ratio uh, involved and the concentration of, a, of the virus stock allowed to stay under 11 log TC50 per, per square meters. Um, because we know that above this uh, value, there is a higher risk of overloading the nanofilter, thus clogging the, the smaller pores of the nanofilter. And, um, and the risk is that MVM leakage occurs uh, due to a preferential passage uh, through the larger pores. We maintained a worst, a worst case uh, load of 120 liters per square, per square meters. But for uh, MVM only, we added uh, an intermediate titration point around the target load. Uh, and this intermediate sample uh, aims to check when MVM leakage appears, uh, as we saw some leakage in the non GLP study. Here are the results of the GLP study. So MVM load was close to 11 uh, log TCD 50 per square meter as planned in the study design. On the diagram uh, here, you can see an overview of the filtration step with uh, the design and the sampling plan. So sample one was titrated and corresponded to a filtrate of up to 80 liter per square meters. Then the filtration was carried on up to uh, 120 liter per square meters. The process pause was performed during 30 minutes before buffer flush. And the sample two is um, the corresponds to the whole filtrate, uh, including pose and buffer flush and reflects uh, really the manufacturing process. So you can see in the table that uh, in sample one, no MVM leakage was uh, observed up to 80 liter per square meters uh, with a high log reduction factor above, uh, above six. When we look at sample two, we still have a high log reduction factor, but some MVM particles appeared in the filtrate. So if we compare uh, these GLP results uh, uh, to the non-GLP uh, results, uh, the non-GLP result uh, study had a, a similar design, but with two process poses instead of one process pose in the GLP one. So we understood that MVM passage was more likely due to process poses uh, more than to the quantity of uh, test item loaded on the nanofilter. So it's also interesting to look at the filterability uh, profiles of the GLP runs. Uh, so we, we observed that uh, the profile of clogging uh, was not impacted in presence of uh, viruses. In fact, when we compare spite runs with a mock run, so it is a very important uh, data. It means that for GLP study with PLANOVA 20N, it is not necessary to define spiking ratio, spike, spiking ratio in advance as a function of filterability, uh, as it is usually the case with, uh, with other types of nanofilters. So to sum up, uh, thanks to the risk mitigation strategy and to the non-GLP uh, study, we achieved a very good uh, viral clearance efficiency and validation was successful at the, at the first time. So no need to add samples or to revalidate other steps. At the end, the GMP batch uh, was run at uh, 50 liter per square meter, so within the scope of validation. And thanks to all the data that we gathered uh, in the non-GLP and GLP studies, we know that for further batches, uh, we are able to decrease the, the surface of Planova 20N if we want to decrease the cost, for example. The step duration would be longer, but uh, we would still be in the validation scope and uh, we would still achieve uh, good log reduction values uh, above four.
So to conclude, uh, this work demonstrated that thanks to a smooth collaboration with suppliers and partners, we achieved uh, successfully uh, the implementation of a reliable uh, and consistent uh, nanofiltration step with ANOVA 20N. Thanks to the reactivity of ASAI and Virusha, we were able to leverage the risk for our viral clearance study just on time. And so thank you to all the teams involved in this work, especially uh, the DSP team from uh, GTP Biologics with Mathieu Verag. And a special thank also to ASAI team for their support and uh, as well, uh, thanks to the, the partners of Virusha and Charles River, Charles River Laboratory. Well, thank you for, for your attention, and I can now answer any question if there is uh, any. Thank you, Audrey. Great talk. And we have already two questions popping in. So for the first question is, do you have an idea what impacted by EX performance? Uh, no, I assume that uh, may, maybe it's related to the, the pressure that we used for this uh, experiment because uh, we made the choice to, uh, to run the BioX at two bars only and uh, maybe this is not the optimal pressure for this, uh, this type of filter. It is more recommended to work at uh, three bars uh, on the BioX, but uh, our uh, manufacturing constraints uh, uh, imposed us to, to work uh, at two bars, so, so maybe this is the, the reason why it performed, uh, low, it performed not uh, as better uh, as it can. Okay. Um, I just have one follow-up question. Are you planning to perform bioex studies with different kind of pre-filters? Bioex studies with other pre-filters? Um, Yes, maybe it could be uh, an idea to, to improve uh, its performance. Uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, a 0 0.22 micron PS filter in this, uh, in, in this project uh, was, uh, was enough. And uh, I'm not sure it could improve uh, a lot, uh, but it could be uh, an option. Okay, so the next question is, how long did you store your sample at 5 degrees before non-GLP study, study use? Uh, so the, um, the samples, the test items were stored uh, between one and two months uh, before the GLP study, but it was stored at uh, minus 20 degrees, not, uh, not at, uh, at 5 degrees. Uh, it was really a choice because at five degrees, our product was less stable, uh, high risk of uh, aggregation, and, uh, and we know that it can, uh, it can, it can impact the, the nanofiltration. So that's why we froze uh, our test item. So yes, at least one month under the storage. Okay, thank you. The next question here appears is, was there any issues with the aggregation or product degradation due to filtration? Uh, no, we didn't see any issue uh, with uh, any change. In fact, in the in the in the molecule and in its quality, so uh, no aggregation uh, and uh, no aggregation after thawing, for example, and uh, and the the monoclonal antibody kept its quality uh, all along the filtration as well. Okay. So I'm now asking Uwe if you have any question for Audrey. No, thank you very much, uh, Audrey. Just for clarification, um, I didn't get it. What is your actual process condition? So do you store just before virus filtration uh, at um, two to eight degrees, or what, what do you, and for how long? So in fact, we during the manufacturing process. Uh, our material is stored at five degrees in the process. So we have uh, the anion exchange step and uh, the, the day after we perform the nanofiltration, the holding time is at five degrees, uh, but it's short. Uh, for the validation study, uh, we, uh, we knew that we had a, a delay between the generation of the test yeah. item of the material and the GLP study. Uh, it was several days, uh, several weeks. Yeah. Uh, so, and we knew that our material won't be stable at five degrees. So yeah. we froze it, 
and we made these trials uh, at small scale to check that there were no impact of freezing and to demonstrate yeah. uh, that uh, there was uh, no impact. No, well, that's clear. Thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, maybe one last question from Takeda. How do you explain the sudden de decrease of flow between 180 and 240 minutes for the non-GLP study with uh, MVM spike, process pause, but only one degree decrease with two pauses in the study plan? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, there was just one decrease, I think, in the... I should look at the graphs more in details, maybe, to answer the question. I, I can have a look at this, uh, because in the non-GLP study, we had just uh, one pause, so one decrease uh, in the graph. Yeah. Anyway, we can follow up with these questions. So thank you for your great talk. Great to have okay, you here. Okay, thank you. And, uh, so right now, we will move to the next speaker. And now I'm handling into Uber. Thanks again, Audrey. And uh, we will hear more from uh, BioX in the next uh, case study uh, from KinBio, uh, represented by Dr. Ayele Cooper. Ayele is Process Development Manager at KinBio, which is a biopharmaceutical company developing and manufacturing innovative and biosimilar drugs. She is uh, responsible for the development and manufacturing processes of cell-derived recombinant proteins, which includes um, upstream and downstream processing, scale-up tech transfer, troubleshooting, and technical uh, support. And along with that, she's also responsible for multiple project management um, roles within the company's uh, uh, projects, within the company's portfolio. Ayele uh, holds a PhD in neurobiology from Weizmann Institute um, she, in Israel, and she has experience of more than 10 years in the biopharmaceutical industry in leading CMC development of combination products, recombinant proteins, and plasma-derived purification processes as well as project management of early and advanced phase, um, advanced phase products. So ILA, the stage is yours and uh, warm welcome. Thank you. So the next speaker, please. Hello, I am Ayala Cooper and I work at Kim Bio Israel. In this talk, I will present the study of viral removal by BioX nanofilter of protein samples at high concentration of more than 70 gram per liter. Let me start with a short introduction to KinBio. KinBio is a biopharmaceutical company focused on the development and production of complex drugs and mammalian derived immunoglobulin. We are part of global group, including King Friend, Kindos, and Xentria, with capabilities of development, manufacturing, and worldwide commercialization. Our portfolio includes innovative products, biosimilars, and complex generic drugs. We also offer CDMO services, and you are more than welcome to contact me if you are interested in a service for development, characterization, and manufacturing of protein therapeutics. Let's start with our incentive for nanofiltration at high protein concentrations. The common production process of any recombinant protein follows this scheme. First, the protein is being produced by live cells, could be bacteria, yeast, or mammalian, on the upstream process. Then we purify the protein on the downstream process, normally by a series of chromatography steps. The viral filtration by nanofilter is usually located at the end of the drug substance process prior to final concentration. We suggest to move the final concentration upstream before nanofiltration 
And by that, we're moving a DFF step from the process. Keep in mind that a spatial separation is required between nanofilter load and filtrate, meaning that you can also save a TFF system in the filtrate collection room. Therefore, we study the effect of concentrated sample on the filter capacity and flow rate. The product studied is a CHO-derived monoclonal antibody at various concentrations of 30 mg per ml in red, 75 and 80 mg per ml. We worked under constant pressure of 40 psi, which is about 2.7 bar. The filter used were either 0 0.0003 meter square or 0 0.001 meter square, which are in blue and light blue in the figure. The figure presents the calculated amount of IgG filtered per meter square versus time in minutes. The study results show high capacity of more than 2.5 kilogram IgG per meter square nanofilter. We did not reach filter block, only stopped when the sample was finished or after four hours, as you can see here. So practically the capacity was even above four kilogram IgG per meter square nanofilter at all concentrations. There was a concentration effect with reduced flow rate at higher concentrations compared to the 30 milligram per ml with no alteration in the flow rate during filtration. So the flow rate remained constant throughout the process, which is indicated by the figure straight lines. The effect of sample concentration on flow rate was indicated also when we tested several concentrations from 40 to 110 milligram per ml. In this study, only 0.001 meter square BioX nanofilter were used. The average filtrate rate at milligram IgG per minute is represented for each concentration tested. According to this summary table, a reverse correlation between product concentration and flow rate was evident. While the recovery remains high, up to 80 mg per ml. As you can see, at 110 mg per ml, the nanofilter was blocked, and at 90 mg per ml, the recovery was slightly impaired. Therefore, we have decided to keep the concentration up to 80 mg per ml. At this stage, we knew that nanofiltration at high concentration keeps the recovery high, the capacity constant, and that there is certain reduction in flow rate. However, we were not worried about reduced flow rate, as four hours filtration is more than reasonable. So we have continued to a viral clearance study. It was important for us to get a preliminary indication on the effect of protein concentration on, on viral clearance before we lock the process. Thus, a non-GMP viral clearance study was performed by Virusure at Vienna in collaboration with Asai Kasai, where they compared the efficiency of BioX to remove viruses from our product at either 30 or 75 gram per liter. The studied virus model was MMV, mouse minute virus. They worked under constant pressure of 2.7 bar and incorporated two pressure breaks of 30 minutes during product filtration and prior buffer post wash.
The following figure illustrates the study flow rate in LMH per time in minutes. The sample at 30 gram per liter, seeing gray, with virus spike, had a constant flow rate of about 35 LMH. With flow break at the planned pressure stop. The sample at 75 gram per liter at blue line with virus spike had a constant flow rate of about 10 LMH with a flow break due to pressure break again. Filtration without addition of spike virus was compared at 75 gram per liter seen orange, where the flow was also constant at about 15 LMH. Take it together. The flow rate was slightly reduced with the virus spiked on the 75 gram per liter sample and the flow rate of the spiked 30 gram per liter sample was much higher than both 75 gram per liter runs as expected. Let's have a look at the study results. The flow chart above illustrate the study outline. 50% of the sample was filtered and then the pressure break was taking place and samples were withdrawn. See first break in orange. The other 50% 50 50 sample was then filtered followed by another pressure break and finalized by buffer postwash. The pool sample represent the complete study marked in green at the table. The study results indicated on high performance in all tested concentrations of IgGx, known as the nosoma. After the first break, the, with more than four logs reduction, and on the total filtrate pool with more than five logs reduction. Similar results were achieved with another product studied before, named here IgG product Y, and also known as adalimumab, that also had more than five logs reduction on a previous MMV study. To summarize, MMV log reduction was above four, even at 75 gram per liter for IgG product. Viral filtration at high concentration enables removal of TFF concentration step while keeping efficient viral elimination. Subtracting the last TFF step from your process will improve overall process recovery and reduce manufacturing cost by saving equipment, manpower, facility hours, etc. I would like to thank my collaborators for their devoted work, both from a Saikasai, Sebastian Tays, and Konstantin Doshishti Agoli, and from Virashu, Tanya Jax, Jürgen Ebner, and Andy Bailey. And of course, to my dear colleagues, Mayu Butbul, Noah Prilik, and Dora Melamed. Thank you all for attending and listening. Thank you, great talk again. So we have a couple of questions coming up. So the first one is, why do you think that you see such an effect and did you observe such an effect on different products? Um, hi, thank you. Uh, I guess they mean such an effect on the concentration of the protein on the flux. Uh, so I, I guess it's just a physical uh, thing that uh, you have more, um, well, I'm a biologist, so I don't think it's a biological interaction. It's something more the physics uh, that, that affects the flux. So it's not my expertise. 
Okay, so and the next question, does virus filtration implementation at high MAP concentration like more than 40 milligram per milliliter is common practice? Have you evaluated other virus filters manufactured at uh, such high concentration? Um, so we use the BioX for all our products because this is our common practice. We started it with products that are uh, produced at um, uh, lower protein concentrations, such as uh, around 40, and then when we we had products with in larger protein, con uh, greater protein con concentration, we decided to use the same uh, platform. Well, we tested it at least, as you can see. Um, I don't think that we can switch to other uh, filters because the BioX has the advantage of working at very high uh, pressure, um, but it was not tested uh, by us. We worked only with the BioX. And I think the common practice is usually the one I uh, presented at the beginning with the scheme, where you do the nanofiltration and then the final concentration following that. I hope I answered all the questions. Thank you. So, Uwe, do you have any questions? Yeah, so with regard um, um, or referring to the earlier presentation uh, where we saw that um, issue with aggregation, um, the question is, my question is, how generic is your method? Because I see the advantages that you are describing, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us how many different antibodies you have worked with so far? And can you also disclose the subclasses of those that uh, have been part of the case study that you described? Um, okay. Um, so uh, I have experience with IgG type 1 at 40 gram per liter. Uh, that's one product, this, and two others that I have presented here. Uh, one of them is IgG type 1, and the other is IgG type 2. Um, the aggregate level is very low because these are recombinants, so we have to keep it low, so it is below 1%. And I think that's one of the reasons it is doable. Um, that's it. <laughs> and you have not come across an outlayer where you couldn't apply your method so far? Uh, no, we thought we reached the limit with this last product when we had to work at about 75, 80. And still it seems like uh, we haven't reached the limit, yeah? Yeah, thank you very much. and. Uh, Best regards to Rehovot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your nice talk. And now we can move to the next speaker. And I'm handling to you again, Uwe. Yeah, the, the concluding uh, presentation um, of uh, session C comes from uh, Fujifilm Diocense Biotechnologies. Um, from uh, Carmen Heran. Carmen graduated with a degree in applied biology from the University of Teesside back in 2008 and um, immediately started at uh, Avicia Biotech as a research scientist, where she is now in her 12th year with a company. And uh, we know it's still the same company that got acquired by MSD and then later on by Fujifilm Diocent biotechnologies and um, she has progressed meanwhile to a principal scientist. Uh, she has gained uh, vast experience in a wide range of disciplines relating to recombinant protein expression and purification and they, then later specializing also in the purification of monoclonal antibodies. And for the past two years she has been the downstream lead for the process development uh, of uh, the uh, continuous biomanufacturing platform that is also in the center of the 
case study that she's presenting now. Um, welcome, Carmen. So we can move to the last speaker of today's first section. So I'm Carmen Heeren and I'm a principal scientist within the downstream processing department at Fujifilm Diasynth Biotechnologies. So I'm going to go through some of the work that we did last year, um, so the end of 2020, on the operation of a continuous biomanufacturing platform for the production of a monoclonal antibody at 500 litre scale. Um, so a quick overview of us as a company and some of the technologies that we have. Um, so in 2014, we um, launched our Apollo mammalian expression platform. Um, and in 2017, we launched um, its sort of downstream counterpart, um, which is the downstream MAB processing platform. Um, in 2019, we launched Apollo X, which superseded our Apollo. Um, and that was sort of the next generation um, expression platform. And the same year we launched the Symphonex bioprocessing rig. Um, so this is one rig that it can perform all the unit operations using the same floor path. Um, and it has the capability for connected and automated processing. Um, so an overview of this presentation, um, I'm gonna go through the DSP um, processing overview, um, bio burden control, um, liquid process, flowing process, um, a mass balance, a summary, and a look at some of the future work that we'd like to do. Um, so in this slide as well, we've got a, a picture of um, the facility that was set up. Um, and you'll see behind here, we have all the buffers. So all the buffers were from stock. Um, we used all inline dilution. Um, and it's a notably small footprint. Um, so in here, you've got enough um, buffers to perform four full batches. Um, and this is actually about a quarter of the size of our 1000 litre MCC facility. Um, so challenges, assumptions and unknowns. So continuous manufacturing um, has been assessed as a means for the manufacture of approved clinical products. However, there are a number of assumptions, challenges and unknowns that come with demonstrating that and the feasibility of such processes. Um, so one of those things is bio burden strategy. Um, how do we control and measure the introduction of bio burden within a continuous process? Um, resourcing, so manufacturing staff, quality staff, um, you know, it's it's all well and good if you can do this, but if it's going to take so many staff to run it, um, is the cost benefit there? Um, footprint is also considered within that cost benefit um, assessment. Um, so quality function, um, what is a batch and how would we disposition whatever we term to be a batch? Um, so you see a very testing um where, where do you decide your start of one batch and end of another batch is? Um, technology deployment. So one of the issues with continuous processing um, is the bottleneck of flow between upstream and downstream. So you've got to get that cadence right. Um, obviously, perfusion technology um, often delivers lower titers relative to batch reactors. Um, so any benefit of operating in a continuous manner um, is sometimes undercut by the column loading times if you sat waiting for your protein A to load. Um, so one of the things that we developed here at Fujifilm is um, single pass TFF technology, which concentrates the perfuser in one single pass and it just brings the cadence of that capture step back in line. Um, so out of all these questions and challenges was born Project YAM or Project YAM. So YAM's actually a small quaint town, which is near our site in the northeast um, that our Japanese colleagues are particularly fond of. Um, and it also loosely references the Y shape of an antibody. So um, that's why we've got a, a pretty strange name going on there. Um, so the project was initiated to support the industry demand. Um, and develop an offering of outsourced continuous manufacturing. So the aim was to provide a proof of concept evidence to potential clients and answer the questions that we've just went through in, in the previous slide. So first of all, can we? Um, and secondly, is it worthwhile? Um, so we used a model map, which was an anti muc one, um, an IgG1, and we produced that using a perfusion adapted Apollo XL line in a 500 litre um, sub. So this was producing about 500 litres a day. Um, then we had seven downstream 
um, Symphonex purification rig. So it's a pretty um, typical MAB process. Um, so the setup was a non-GMP facility and it would operate for a month. Um, so the aim was to run the reactor for um, a minimum of 20 days with a target of 35 days. Um, so we opted that we would continuously process one six-day batch up to CEX Eluet, um, and a second six-day batch right up to BDS and pack off. Um, so you'll see that we did opt for intensive cycling as opposed to um, fully continuous. Um, so the viral filtration, um, this this was one um, part where we were we were considering which which viral filter do we use um, and we thought we need something that can take you know anything that we can throw at it um, so we want something with no conditioning um, that's going to deliver us a steady flux um, so we approached Asai Kasai and we opted to use um, their bio ex filter um, and true to farm it performed absolutely brilliantly um, so we got the whole batch processed in one single batch um, and we did opt to do it in this way as opposed to cycling, um, just because it makes the validation so much more straightforward. Um, so everything was intensely cycled up to AX and the VF was performed as, as one batch. Um, so we used the four meter squared bioreax filter um, with a targeted operating pressure of two and a half bar. So the flow was adjusted based on pressure feedback, um, but we didn't see any, any notable flux decay at all. Um, so the whole batch went through, which was just over a thousand litres of feed. Um, with flushes, we ended up with just over 1100 litres of filtered material. It's about 3.1 gram per litre, which was about three and a half kilos of MAB. Um, we saw just over 99% recovery um, and a throughput of 286 litres per metre squared. Um, and here's a picture of it being processed using the Symphonex rig and um, so you'll see here's the filter uh, not to be confused with this here which is our mixing chamber combo bubble trap um, and yet there's not a lot to to mention on this because the, the step performed really really well. Um, so the bio burden control strategy um, the main concern here was protecting this sterile boundary here so if we got a bit of contamination here or here, um, it's potentially just a couple of cycles ditched or one downstream batch, which was at worst six days worth of stuff. Um, whereas if if we get a contamination in the reactor, you know, that, that's catastrophic. So um, that was our main concern. Um, we were operating upstream and downstream all in one room, one, one suite. So we had, um, you know, dirtier downstream operations. Um, and people going back and forth from upstream to downstream. Um, we we did just use standard overshoes, lab coats, um, Tyvex for media preps, but nothing above and beyond that. Um, so we were in non-clean room environment. Um, so this truly did test the bio bird and control strategy. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we found um, poor setup um, was the actual bio burden testing. So this was probably the riskiest point for actually introducing bio burden into the enclosed process. Um, so bio burden learning and results, um, you'll see from batch one, um, the bio burden control appeared to, to work really, really well. So we had no contamination to the reactor. Um, and this confirmed that we can control bio burden between the unit operations um, using functionally closed floor paths um, and all pre-filtered buffers. Um, for batch two, um, again, we saw no bio burden um, in the reactor, um, no contamination, um, but post AEX, we did see a spike of bio burden here. Um, so we think this was introduced um, during setup um, because unfortunately, the root cause analysis to this said that um, it was operator error um, and the um, developmental filter was not sanitized prior to being um, installed. Um, but every cloud, um, one thing we, we did gain from this is we proved that at the back end here and um, we did manage to clear the buyer burden um, at final filtration. So by um, what would be disposition, um, all the buyer burden was reduced within reasonable levels. 
Um, so liquid flowing process. Um, so we were using this um, as a measure of successful automation and downstream operation. Um, so all of the liquid transfer was completely hands off between the unit ops. Um, so they were operated on weight and volume triggers. Um, and we were assessing process performance um, using analytics of samples and the volume mass changes within those tanks. Um, so sampling was dependent on homogeneous material, which posed us the challenge, when do you sample the pool um, if it's continuously processed? Um, so we did aim to um, sample at set times, but this wasn't always feasible. Um, and then we were working on the assumption that tank weight and transition rates were a good measure for consistent error-free processing. So if all your illusions look similar, then you, you're in a good place. You, your transfers are happening as they should, when they should. Um, and from being on the shop floor of this, um, you did very quickly manage to spot if something was not quite right. So you you quickly bedded into um, the rhythm and, and you saw what volumes you were expecting. Um, and if anything was amiss, you did very quickly notice that. Um, so this is um, a graph of our protein air tank volumes. Um, so we performed 27 cycles in total. Um, blue was the protein air feed um, and orange is the eluate. So here's your feeds here and here's your eluate and each individual spike is one cycle. So you'll see all the elutions are pretty consistent. Um, we saw no more variability than you would expect within a, a batch process. Um, this wave here was as we were adjusting the single pass TFF um, to try and achieve a stable hold volume, which you'll see we did in the end. Um, the viral inactivation tank volume. So the blue is the feed, which is pretty much just the um, transfer from the protein elution um, to, to the start tank for the VI. Um, so they're all very consistent. Um, in the post VI pool, we did see a creep up here, um, and that was um, down to a pH drift within the probe. Um, so we just introduced a daily calibration, um, which seemed to, to sort that out. Um, and again, it's it's something that we see, it's a challenge across the industry. Um, so it's not, not specific to continuous processing. Um, the CEX tank volumes, again, we see a, a slight shift, which mirrors um, the VI, but that's, again, due to that pH drift, the volumes onto the CEX were slightly bigger. Um, but the elution volumes were very, very consistent. Um, so, again, we can say that this was successfully automated. Um, mass balance um, was good. So we established all the mass balances um, in PD and the yields were completely as expected um, from the batch operation. So we did see a higher than typical loss on the CEX um, and that was found to be um, we were losing a litre of load in the mixing chamber. Um, so we just started to load with that and bypass and that mitigated those losses. Um, you'll see here the typical um, mean volume and concentration onto the SPTFF was about 1.59 gram per litre. Um, and by the time it had been through the SPTFF, so onto our capture column, it was between 2.6 and 2.9 um, gram a litre. Um, so in summary, um, we successfully packed off 3.2 kilogram of purified MAB from about 3,600 litres of perfusate, um, which equates to about 0.9 kilos of MAB per day on the downstream um, and 0.54 kilo per day of BDS. Um, so it was really successful. Um, we produced a lot of material um, very, very easily, surprisingly. Um, the bio burden control strategy um, seemed to be successfully implemented for connected processing. Um, and we did get a lot of learning um, with batch switch out, so um, floor path changes and things like that. Um, so ongoing and future work, we'd um, like to look at the pH probe drift. Um, this does need to be improved by a GMP batch, but again, this is a universal problem for the industry. Um, we did see a bit of back pressure on the protein air column, whereby we had to lower the flow rate a little, um, but it wasn't enough to affect the cadence of everything downstream. Um, so that wasn't too, too huge a deal. Um, and 
now all of this has been launched as our MarrowX continue bioprocessing. Um, so yeah, if you want any more information on that, it's all on our website. Okay, so unfortunately, Carmen is not able to make it to the live section. But if you have any questions, you can type it in. I will address it with her afterwards and get back to you. Um, we have already a first question from Takeda. What do you do when the virus filter IT fails? Um, if I remember, they are doing the uh, bio exfiltration in batch mode, so I'm not sure if they have validated a refiltration, uh, re so I will confirm with Carmen. So, Uwe, one question for you is Lonza also thinking this way to me, um, yeah, to do a continuous process and continuous um, filtration. Can you yeah, give your experience on this uh, continuous processing? Yes, absolutely, we are. And unfortunately, at this point, I cannot share any details. But um, um, of course, for some uh, customers, you know, we are a service provider and we don't have our own brand. So we uh, basically um, focus on what uh, uh, customers uh, expect um, from us in terms of technological capabilities. And of course, we see more and more a uh, move um, from a batch manufacturing towards continuous and intensified manufacturing for various reasons. Um, and uh, yes, that's part of our future uh, portfolio. Mm -hmm. When it's coming to the nanofiltration virus clearance, um, do you have any idea how to perform the virus clearance studies, how to um, yeah, go in this direction? Any thoughts on that? I guess we have the same uh, questions here like uh, everybody else and we need to uh, collaborate there with the experts that are part of this symposium here and uh, we had discussed in the past but um, i don't want to speculate here as uh, with regard to what the most robust again um, pointing back to our motto here in terms of regulation and quality will be. But there are, of course, uh, hopefully solutions to that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of questions, but I have to check the answers that come here and, and we'll get back to the answers. And right now we're coming to the end of the first section. So I'm leaving to you, Uwe, for closing remark for this section. Yeah, not much uh, uh, to be added from my side here. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate that um, uh, I guess uh, uh, we have we are not able to raise any uh, direct questions to Carmen at this point. Uh, is she she's not connected because it was pre-recorded, or what's the uh, issue with yeah. that? Right. That's correct. Um, the um, uh, the talk was pre-recorded, but. Today she has some personal reasons and cannot join for the Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's absolutely understandable. So um, I thank uh, very much again on behalf of the organi organizers and Matitas and myself, um, the presenters for uh, bringing up very uh, relevant um, aspects of their work with regard to Planova 20N and uh, BioX, uh, which are um, to a certain extent also representative uh, to other um, filter classes, to other also uh, product classes. And uh, I thank the um, participants of this symposium for their, again, also very relevant question. And um, as uh, semi-directional as this um, is currently here, with a virtual setup, uh, I'm quite happy the way it worked out and uh, it had been organized um, and set up by um, Azahi Kaze. Uh, so a big compliment. And uh, once again, I hope to be able to meet all of you in person um, 
during the next symposium, either in the US or in Europe? Definitely for the European symposium, we might be able to meet face to face. Um, the question which we are not able to address in this section, um, our Planoa representative will get in touch with you with the answers. And also thank you from my side to all the speakers and especially for you, Uwe, for chairing this section. And we will have a break right now and we will start the next session at 3.30, which will be chaired by uh, Nathan Ross and my colleague Constantine. So see you soon and thank you. Thank you all. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the final session, which will cover new technologies and trends. My name is Konstantin Agoli. I am Senior Product Manager and Biooptimal TFF Specialist working at Asai Kasai Bioprocess Europe, and I am excited today to introduce our chair for the session, Dr. Nathan Ross. Nathan is the head of R&D at CSL Bering in Bern, Switzerland. He leads the Plasma Product Development Group in Bern, specializing in the development of next-generation immunoglobulin process development, as well as new plasma protein therapies. Nathan has, also has global responsibility for the PPD-CMC strategy teams and recently gained responsibility for CSL's PPD Global Bioanalytic Team. Until recently, Nathan was also responsible for the Global Pathogen Safety Organization. GPS is now headed by Eleanor Wittmer, who is supported by familiar pathogen safety leaders such as Barry Gooch and Audrey Brussel. Before I hand it over to you, Nathan, I would just like to remind everyone that if you have a question, please use the chat box during the presentation. We will follow up any unanswered questions. Nathan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And, and I'd like to thank Asahi for inviting me to um, be a chair for um, this um, valuable workshop. So um, yeah, so th this uh, last session will be on new technologies and trends. And we have three uh, really interesting talks coming up. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Uh, Nishiza Nishizaka. Um, Dr. Nishizaka is a uh, professor in the physics department um, at uh, Gakushun University, which is the oldest private university in Japan, uh, located in Tokyo. Um, Dr. Uh, Nishizaka is, is really um, a very, very well-established uh, researcher and uh, has published very, uh, quite a bit. Uh, in, in some of the top journals, having over 10 journals, uh, 10 articles accepted in Nature and the Nature family, as well as uh, four other articles in the Proceeding of National Academy of Sciences. Um, those of you who've seen uh, the previous presentations by uh, Dr. Nishizaka can get blown away by some of the images that uh, he's actually shown. Um, and he's really furthered our, in, our understanding of uh, virus filtration. Um, so today's talk is, um, is about the direct visual, visualization of virus removal process in hollow, hollow fiber membranes using an optical microscope. So with that, Dr. Nishizaka. Thank you very much, Thank Nathan. Thank you for introduction. So could, if we could start the presentation. My name is Taka Nishizaka, a researcher working with Japan. When you talk about the established virus removal filter for novel, I guess that what most of the imagine is this size used in actual production sites for medical drugs. This cassette includes thousands of very thin fiber membranes inside. Now, my research subject is that this tiny single fiber made of cells, which is less than one millimeter in diameter and thus enormously soft. Surprisingly, this single fiber has the ability to capture viruses, whereas target proteins pass it through the membrane. So here is the motivation. Don't you want to watch the real process directly by your eyes? Actually, one of my students did that. She clearly visualized the sort of true behavior of viruses under an optical microscope by a technical tooth force. Now, let me start my slides. Today, I'd like to focus on this subject, visualization of the virus removal process. All results I, I presented today were published as an original research paper early this year. The purpose of the project is the visualization of biomolecules, mainly virus, in the plasma membrane filter. 
Especially, I'd like to remark the keyword in the second content title, tracking the behavior, which means visualize the moment when filtration starts. We also achieved super resolution analysis, which enables to detect a slight shift of the trapped virus position with high accuracy. We use a single fiber from the commercial product from the TNTN, in which one end was capped while the other end was connected to the syringe pump. The solution was injected with a constant flow speed. With this simple setup, we can infuse any sample labeled by fluorescent probe into the single hollow fiber. We applied a confocal microscopy, which enables to detect the sample only in confocal body. You can minimize the signal from other sections which originated from sample locating different focal planes. And therefore, the main signal should be reliable and reproducible with very low background. This schematic shows the tube arrangement for the observation system. In the injector, there are two flow pathways which allow us to inject the sample during observation. Single fiber is gently immobilized by supporting freight and weight and the medium passes through the membrane to stored in the spacing, locating with both sides, working as a reservoir. There is a hole in the middle of the plate, and we observe the section of the fiber located around there. Now let me move on to the result parts. Today I prepared three stories. The first one is the continuum injection of virus particles. Please note that in this presentation, we use not real viruses, but virus-like particles, termed as VLPs, as an alternative for the safety handling with the standard lab bench. VLPs comprise capsid proteins from minute virus of mice MVM, which you can purchase from the biotechnology company Cygnus Technologies in North Carolina. We label VLPs with commercial fluorescent pro product called Dilite 488 and purified by high pressure liquid chromatography just before use to remove free residual proteins that fail to construct the particles. Now, let me show you the first video, which will be one of the highlights of my talk. The center part is a single panel fiber that is embedded in parallel to the glass light. And we are watching this section from the bottom as shown in the right schematic. Two dashed lines indicate the left edge and right edge of the fiber, and the thickness of the inner diameter is about 600 microns. The solution was infused from the top side in this case and flows into both sides through the membrane. Even without the dashed lines, autofluorescence of the membrane roughly indicates its position with this suit color representation. Now the time is minus 10 minutes, which means 10 minutes before the leading fraction of the sample will reach the observation area. From the time zero, you will start to see shut signal in the middle of the membrane. And let me start the video. I think that you easily recognize a bright line in the membrane and its intensity is increasing brighter and brighter with time. So what you're watching is a sort of a live show of virus removal filtration process observed under my optical microscope at the single fiber level. Actually, this process is more evident in the magnified view. See the top left you know, picture. You can even indicate, I think, the region of the accumulation by your finger. And the position is really stable. This video directly demonstrates that there is a reliable and uniform structure in the plant membrane filter, which are unable to retain all the VLPs we are watching. This is the power of the Planova. It's beautiful, I think. Okay, now let me move on to the analysis part. This graph shows a one-dimensional fluorescent profile of a single panel fiber, and the x-axis is a direction perpendicular to the fiber axis. The left and the right peak shows a fluorescent signal from VLP that they're of course retained in the middle of membrane. Because of the, sorry for that, non-uniformity of the illumination of our laser system, we, here, we would like to focus only left signal in the following analysis. Red, blue, and green line represent the data taken from time zero, one hour, two hours respectively, and the peak values clearly rise with time. 
So I took each peak value and plot their time course as shown in the right graph. The relationship is linear. It's actually expected because the flow rate of our system is constant and thus a solution containing DLPs passes through the membrane at the steady speed. So the right graph represents not only the stability of our experiment setup, but also it's important, the linearity of our, de de our detection method. Okay, I think I convinced all of you that I clearly demonstrate that the VLP are stable retained at a specific position in the middle of the membrane. Please let me move to the next method. So the reason why we perform the different type of injection is we wanted to visualize the true behavior of leading fraction, the leading fraction. In the con continual injection that I showed you, new, v new VLPs were trapped in the membrane one after another. So what we observed was a sort of accumulation of particles. That makes sense, right? In contrast, if, if we will successfully inject a certain amount of sample, we may track the behavior as a time course of the change in something. So the short injection, the germ we created, so let me explain this detail. So this is your single fiber and the solution without VLPs is infused for two hours in order to equilibrate the condition of the fiber. Then the certain amount of sample, in this case, only 200 microliter of the fluorescent the VLPs was shot by using the injective. After that, the original medium is infused and so, and so we call this procedure as a short injection. We start to record with a five minutes interval from just before the sample will reach the fiber. We expect that we will be able to detect the moment when VLP reaches the fiber. Okay, I'd like to show you second video, next live show. Right now, this frame is minus 20 minutes and so four frames later, at the time of zero, the leading fraction of VLP will reach. You will see signal in the middle and that the intensity will become brighter. Uh, now let me start the video. Three, two, one, zero. Brighter, 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 but the signal become, become plateaued. Like this, there is no big change about the signal. Let me repeat again, three, two, one, zero, brighter, 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 but the signal is plattered because I shot a certain amount of the VMPs. Now I hope I convinced most of you that we watched a certain amount of VLPs as a peak which are retained in the membrane. But I think some of you may also recognize, hey, is the signal drifting leftward? If you noticed, you have really good one, uh, you have really good eyes, congratulations. Actually, when my students announced me, it, I was very, very surprised because it was a truly unexpected output. And so we carefully tracked the behavior of the peak position of VLP. To analyze the data more quantitatively, we here introduce so-called super-resolution analysis. This graph shows a very magnified view of the intensity of VLPs in one frame, one video frame. The grid line, in the grid in x-axis is only two microns and the distribution is pixelized due to the sensor chip of the camera we used. Actually, you may indicate the peak position by your finger. I mean, which pixel is the brightest one like this? But if you do that, your resolution is limited by the pixel size, about one micro in this case. That's not what we want. Instead, you can fit values of multiple pixels with an appropriate function as shown in red curve. And then the true peak position appears as the center of the function. This is the hurt of the super resolution analysis, which ideally allows you to the allows you the localization of nanometer scale. We use applied several tricks, but to make a long story short, finally, we visualize the displacement of the peak, which was originated from the same VLP pack. In the right graph, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the distance measured from the outer edge in the left membrane section. 
as shown in the left graph, the peak displaced with time, like 0, 20 minutes, 155 minutes, and the pink line in the right graph shows a fitting with a simple exponential decay, which fits very well to our results. Now, let me formulate the behavior of single particles in order to explain the situation, what happened, really happened. We can assume two forces. One is a driving force pushed by the fluid and resistance force from the membrane structure against the moving particle. In the world of low Reynolds number, these two forces are always balanced and the net velocity is determined as a consequence. Our idea is simple. The trapping force depends on the position. It's natural because the structure becomes denser as a particle goes deeper. And the fluid force also becomes larger as particle velocity is smaller because the force is proportional to relative velocity against the flow. So I skip some calculations due to the limitation of time, but the important point is we finally estimate the force field derived from the membrane structure. To fulfill our results, the exponential decay regarding the position Fm should follow the equation between center. It's very simple. It represents the first attempt quantitatively evaluating real-time particles' behavior and, and also should provide new insights, hopefully, into designing novel fiber membranes. Before closing my talk, I'd like to show you one more video as a bonus. I'm sure all of, you, all of you are interested in how target proteins behave in the membrane. So this is a video. You may see the left edge and the right edge of the fiber, and the solution is a contain, in this case, not the virus, but the fluorescent human IgG will come from the top. See what will happen. OK, three, two, one, zero. So fluorescent uh, proteins come like explosion, and it disappears into both sides. It passes through the membrane. Now let me play again. Three, two, one. Here comes the proteins, and it disappears into the both sides. And please watch the membrane. There are no peaks. Please note that, I mean, after the disappearance of all uh, of, of IgG, there is no evident signal in the membrane. So this is in stark contrast to the case of VLP, which had retained representing the short peak as I've shown in the first and second videos. Okay, I'd like to summarize today's talk. I think we established a new experimental setup which allows us a stable recording for hours and we visualized for the first time in the single fiber, the movement and the target proteins were passed that VLPs were reliably trapped at specific position as a you know, time course of the sort of live show. And the super resolution analysis also allows us to the microscopic, this microscopic displacement of the retained viruses. And all data presented today was published in early this year in the Nature Scientific Reports. And I'd like to thank, acknowledge all these people, Dr. Kubo for his early work and the continuous force to make our project go further. Mr. Watanabe, who entirely supports the research, and Mr. Samo and Dr. Hongo Hirasaki, who are co-authors of the paper. And finally, a graduate student in our lab, Mika Yano, sitting in the front row in this picture, who had to took all the data I presented today. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Nishizaka, for a very interesting presentation. The presentation you Thank showed you. really gives us an idea of the visualization of actually what occurs during the filtration itself. So for us, when we go on filtration trials, it's very interesting to have these images in our mind to really be able to understand what is, what is going on. So thank you very much. Uh, I see here we have a first question from CSL Bering. Uh, here's the question for you. Excellent presentation. How did the pressure evolve during the filtration as this may have a significant impact on the diffusion and migration of the viral particles? Well, we used a very stable syringe pump, so the flow rate is very stable. 
it's so not depends on the pressure value. But we also measure the pressure value, of course, using a gauge. It corresponds to 40 kilopascal in this case. But I apologize for this. We chose only one condition to measure the flow, uh, measure the, this to get to capture the, the, the Im images. So of course, the flow rate and pressure should change the behavior of viruses, but we still do not have enough data to show it. OK, thank you very much. We have a second question from Asaika Say Bioprocess America by our colleague Daniel Strauss, who just presented. Uh, have you tried using your technology to observe filter fouling? Filter what? Fouling, filter flowing, fouling. Ah, fouling. Well, we, we are trying, we, as it's still ongoing subject. So, so again, I'm apologize to say that I do not have enough data to show right now and uh, any clear data to discuss about it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nathan, do you have a question? Yes, so Dr. Nishizaka, again, super, super cool images uh, on there. And uh, <laughs> um, what, what would be really interesting, I think, is to understand a couple different, um, uh, you know, the to observe the retention of the VLPs again, but after the, maybe the filter had been um, preloaded maybe with or pre-treated with a large amount of uh, IG as an example, or maybe a more um, difficult um, feed stream. And, and to see whether or not that positioning or the retention, retention of the virus uh, looks differently under those two conditions. So I'm looking forward for um, uh, if you have any thoughts on that or uh, whether that's a current subject of interest for you, but I think it would be really valuable for the industry to understand that. Yeah, actually we are using just one flow for I mean, the, uh, I mean, the monocolor things, but uh, of course there are so many flow forwards. So technically speaking, we can add many flow forwards to visualize different samples simultaneously under the same microscope. So that's the future we are thinking. Let's say observe the uh, target proteins and the virus particles simultaneously with different colors. And uh, of course, a dependency of the concentrations of the target proteins or some clocking effect, something. I, I think it would be interesting if you could. So a lot of your experiments mm -hmm. are done over a short time. Of, you know, 20 minutes, okay. but if you would be able to perhaps dilute out the, the VLPs and run a, you know, add it to the protein and run it over a much longer time frame, which would more resemble what we actually see in, in real life. And, you know, you could speed up your, your images on that, but it, I think it would add some additional insight uh, for us. Okay. Thank you very much for your comment. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nishizaka-san. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can, maybe we can move to the uh, next presentation, Nathan. Great. So, um, yeah, so our next presenter is um, Sophia Marrera, who um, holds a, a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. Hi, Sophia. And a master's degree in uh, biopharm biotech from the University of Coimbra. Um, so Sophia is actually doing her uh, PhD right now um, at the at IBET, and uh, where she's focused on establishing scalable and GMP compatible purification processes for lentiviral vector in a high throughput manner. And uh, so that uh, Sophia's talk will be um, uh, lentiviral vectors purification, improving current processes, and exploring new strategies. I think this is going to be super interesting, Sophia. Um, welcome. Thank you. So thank you very much, Nathan. Hello, Sophia. If you could please then start the presentation. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of this year's Panova Virtual Symposium. My name is Fia Moreira, and I'm now finishing my PhD at IBET in Portugal. And today, my presentation will be about lentiviral vector purification process. 
But first, let me tell you a little bit about IBET Institute. We are the largest private not-for-profit biotechnology research organization in Portugal that brings together public institutions and private companies as partners and collaborators. We have the opportunity to collaborate with, with several biotech companies and universities in, diver, in different biotech fields around the world. Animal Cell Technology Unit is the major division at IBET where we develop our activities in different uh, fields such as cell and gene therapy, vaccines, recombinant proteins, bioprocess, and others. We collaborate with our partners to different modalities such as research and development projects, contract research projects, satellite labs, and you can also join IBET for advanced training such as a master or PG degree. But we always offer the flexibility and the confidentiality specific to each partner's needs. Genibet is our CMO company founded in 2006 and in which IBET is the major partner. Genibet is mainly focused on the production of biopharmaceutical uh, products for phase one and two, such as ATPMs or even vaccines. Genibet and IBET can also work closely to offer to their clients the uh, support in different project stages, from process development to GMP manufacturing and even to quality control. So regarding uh, lentiviral vectors, uh, these particles are single-stranded RNA enveloped viruses. They have been commonly used for cell and gene therapies. They are particularly interesting since they can integrate the, the genome of dividing and undividing cells, and they've become more popular with the approval of Chimera, the first product using these viruses. Currently, they are the vector of choice when stable and sustaining long-term gene expression is required, and in these recent years, we have witnessed a decline in the use of retroviral vectors due to a more favorable integration profile of the lengthy vectors. LVs represent a major vector of interest for the treatment of morogenic diseases, as well as adoptive cell therapy, since they require gene delivery. They are mainly used for ex vivo approaches that briefly consist in the extraction of patient cells, followed by transduction and cell amplification, and then the modified cells are again reinfused into the patient. These therapies require higher doses per patient, mostly, mostly due to the poor transaction efficiencies. Additionally, some in vivo uh, treatment are also being uh, investigated in the context of, for example, cystic fibrosis or even Parkinson's disease. This growing interest can be observed in the increased number of uh, clinical trials that use these viruses, but unfortunately, they are considered an expensive therapy which are giving rise to a huge effort towards decreasing the LV manufacturing costs. The downstream of LVs aims to maximize the vector recovering and minimize all the actions that can have a negative impact on the efficacy of the product while remaining economically viable. So the DSP is composed by a sequential unit operation that start in the bioproduction and will increase the titer and purity and decrease the bulk volume. Uh, currently, um, the global recovery heal reported are around uh, 20 to 40 percent. In this slide, we have a more detailed image of this purification train when we have also represented the impurity removal in each operation unit. We have also the addition of the endonuclease and also the stabilizers that are being reported to improve um, the recovery heal of this purification process. So much have been done to optimize this uh, process uh, regarding um, several combinations of different chromatography approaches have been explored and also uh, the tangential flow filtration have been evaluated in different stages of the process, for example, in the beginning to uh, concentrate our product and in the end for formulation. However, um, the establishment of a large scale purification process that is uh, GMP compliant remains a challenge. So why this purification process is so challenging? 
Due to the complexity of this virus, there have been different drawbacks, such as in uh, the upstream and the downstream. So regarding the LVs production, the existing adherent cell lines that are used for a transient infection have limited scalability since in order to increase the production style, a huge surface area is required for the cell's attachment. This leads to um, time-consuming manipulation and there are also required a large amount of uh, plasmid DNA, which will increase the manufacturing costs. Currently, they cannot fulfill the higher doses required for a clinical trial, mostly due to uh, low titer productions. In the DSP, uh, due to all the innate feature of DLVs, uh, such as the short of life, to the sensitivity to temperature, to pH, to buffer osmorality, or even to cycles of free stuff, uh, lead to um, often to low recovery yield of these infection particles. These processes are uh, currently characterized by a high number of steps, which are not compatible with a uh, GMP process. So given the low titer production, the time consuming manipulation, and also the limit scalability, the industry had to change their approach. So to cope with the increased doses required for clinical trials, it is necessary to have higher titers and higher yield manufacturing process. For that reason, the industry is migrating fast to more efficient and scalable production platform, which in this case, meaning to suspension platforms. So these suspension cell lines allow a reduction to batch to batch variation, they are easier to perform process control to establish a serum free process, and also they are less time consuming. This transition can in fact improve the process scalability, but at the same time will introduce different challenges into the downstream of the LVs uh, regarding the high process volumes, the change in the impurity profile, and also modifications in the DSP. So today I will be talking about a case study using antiviral vectors regarding this um, shift in the production platform. These results will be in the scope of my PhD's, um, my PhD project uh, that has been focused on establish a continuous high throughput bioprocess that is compatible with uh, good manufacturing practices. Um, but I already uh, developed some work regarding process optimization in adherent systems, but now we are now focused on the optimization of the process using these suspension cell lines. For that reason, we started to establish a production platform using uh, an ADAPT Act 293 cell line, where briefly the cells were expanded, uh, in the bioreactor was inoculated, the cells were transfected with the four um, plasmid system and were harvested after 48 hours. So the transition from an adherent to a suspension system will result in a change mostly in the initial LV material. So the initial turbidity will increase as well as the initial DNA content, which can have a significant impact on the clarification device performance. That's what we will talking about today, the first two the first step that is the clarification. So to perform um, uh, the, this initial step, we have to be uh, some, some features in account. So this complexity will have an impact in the virus recovery since they, are, uh, they, they, have, they have a fragile envelope and they are also sensitive to shear stress. So our clarification device has to be able to uh, perform the turbidity reduction, a high recovery yield, a high throughput, the preservation of the membrane integrity, and also the preservation of the biological activity of these LVs. For that reason, we decided to evaluate, um, we evaluate the bio-optimal of fiber from mosaic assay for this clarification step. 
This device has a pore size of uh, 0.5 micra, which is in line what is described in the literature for uh, the DSLVs, and being an aloe fiber uh, allow us to control the shear rate and minimize the loss of infectious particles. So with the support of Azai Kazai, we performed this preliminary experiment to assess the performance of the bioptimal aloe fiber. We initially started with a volume of 500 milliliters to evaluate this performance. And since we did not observe a decrease in the permeate flux, we uh, several volume additions were performed during this clarification step. They are represented at, in these uh, blue lines. Uh, the filtered flux decreased uh, with time, which was what we were expecting, and it was possible to filtrate at total one liter of these LVs with an average flux of 162 liters per hour per meter square. On the right side, you can have uh, the filtrate throughput and TMP across time, and you can see that with the increase on the fil filtrate throughput, our TMP did not increase, which were a uh, good result. To uh, evaluate, um, to better evaluate the performance of this aloe fiber, another trial was performed. In uh, this table, you have the speed, the two runs that we performed. You have the cell concentration, the turbidity, and also the TU recovery. As an immediate result, you can see on this left image, there is a, not, a massive uh, turbidity reduction before and after the aloe fiber, even with the increase of the cell concentration in the second run. A higher recovery hill was uh, also, a higher recovery hill was also uh, obtained for both the runs and the turbidity reduction of higher than 19% was also achieved. To confirm the, um, integrity, the membrane integrity of these LVs, we performed this stem characterization, which show us that the membrane of the virus remain intact. Here we have more details about these aloe fibers performance. So in the first run, we were able to filtrate one liter, and in this two run, in the second run, we were able to filtrate 1.6 liters of LVs. So this um, second run results were even more uh, satisfactory with the increase of the volumetric concentration factor and the, um, the increase also in the average flux of the, um, the, fil the filtration step with um, a permeate flux around 225 uh, liters per hour per meter square. With this value, we were um, we were we could uh, predict the maximum filtration volume that was uh, around 2.3 liters that we still have to confirm. With the support also with the Zai Kazai in this run, we could predict uh, some uh, scale up features. So, for example, for this uh, bigger run with 1,000 liters. We could perform uh, the same um, the same steps in around 0.5 hours. It shows us that uh, the already scales scales that are available can be very flexible with the with the currently process. As a future work, we would like to explore different uh, experiment conditions in this bioptimal uh, low fiber such as initial cell concentration, TMP, or even the shear rate. We would like to evaluate other viral targets and see if they perform as, as good as these LVs, and also starting to think about some process integration. As a final taking home message, I would like to say to you that this manufacturing process uh, of these complex biologicals have to be a joint effort from the bioproduction to the downstream processing. And only when we can fit all the pieces together, we will be able to arrive to a robust process. 
So I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, Ketchina Pachot e Anastasia Curadinha, Professor Paula Alves and Professor Manuel Carrondo, also my colleagues that contribute to this work, Tiago Faria, Barbara Fernandes, Ricardo Correia, Joana Oliveira, and also to Pinar for all the support during this process. I'll be available from so, for some questions, so feel free to ask one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia, for a very interesting presentation. You must be uh, very pleased with the good results, and it must be very encouraging <laughs> for, the, for the next steps. Uh, I see we already have a, a couple of questions for you. So the first question is about the stabilizers that you use in the downstream process for the lentivirus process. Uh, so there are a few things that you can evaluate for this for the stabilizing agents. So in the literature, you can have reported, for example, proteins like um, BCA or even sugars like sucrose um, or even some amino acids like histamine and glycine, you can evaluate for the stabilization. We already have a paper uh, using this adherent process. In, we, in this case, we use um, sucrose for helping to stabilize these LVs during the, the purification process. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question, uh, did you load your harvested cells on the module or did you centrifuge or filtrate them first? No, no, so this is where direct load with, without, uh, just with the benzonase treatment in the beginning and then all the cells were loaded in the, the device. Okay, uh, just quickly, and now a third question from CSL. Knowing this is a hard question, do you have any considerations or new ideas to integrate virus reduction steps into lentivirus manufacturing? So could you repeat, sorry. Yeah, of course. So the question is, knowing that this is a hard question, so it's already a hard question for you, uh, do you have any considerations or new ideas to integrate virus reduction steps into lentivirus manufacturing? Uh, so, yeah, this is a tough one. Uh, so, what we are trying to... So, initially, in this process that we already established, we were able to perform a direct load on our commodity device without, for example, the initial concentrations that most of the process for the antiviral vector had to do before the chromatography step. And also we are now trying to make this uh, process integration from the clarification to also the um, chromatography step. I don't know if this is answer your question. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I have one one uh, additional question. So, in, in this is great work that you're doing, and um, in, in your early um, work on trying to get this to work for you, what were some of the greatest challenges or or lessons learned um, in the in the early part of your work? Advice that uh, you could regarding give on, this, on yeah, in regarding your regarding, cell lines. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, reg regarding um, your ability to process these through the holofiber membranes? So in our beginning development, we talked with, uh, with Ade Kaze, and one of, one of the major concerns were to establish a shear rate that allows us not to lose infectivity. Because one of the major problems of these LVs is that we have, even when we have uh, all the membrane, um, all the preservation of the integrity of the membrane, if you don't have biological active virus, so your product is not functional. So one of the major concerns were to establish a shear rate that allow us to have this uh, turbidity reduction and also have a um, device that could would be flexible to larger scales because this is a major concern and also to allow that the product will remain actively uh, biologically active to pursue uh, this process and also in the, our, our goal was to achieve this in a fast manner because we still have all these other uh, operations that 
the process have to have to to end up with a fast and also to a highly high heel process because also this this time is important because the LVs has a short life of around six hours. So after six, six hours, we end up with at least half of our starting virus. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. We have one last question. How do you control the shear rate? Uh, so this is um, with your uh, feed, uh, uh, feed flux. You can, in counting all the fibers and in, in, the, in uh, the diameter, you can control the shear rate of your device. And also playing around with the, the flow rate of the recirculation. Yes. The, like, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So I see there's uh, no more further questions. Thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you, Nathan. And if we can Thank maybe you. move on to the next presentation. So our final presenter for today is Dr. Thompson uh, from Novo uh, from uh, Novo Nordisk. Um, Dr. Thomas um, Dr. Thompson uh, finished his PhD in molecular biology in 2017. And, and then did a, a postdoc um, working on vaccine development of various viruses. Uh, he's now been working in the virology department of Novo Nordisk since 2018, working with um, virus clearance and the viral safety of ATMPs. And his work has included extensive characterization, validation of filtrations of upstream and downstream raw materials and process materials. Uh, Dr. Thompson isn't able to be with us today, but his talk will be on the upstream filtration of medias for ATMPs. Thank you, Nathan. If we could start the presentation, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonas Lund Thompson, and I'm from the Department of Virology at Novo Nordisk, and I work as a virus safety coordinator on the stem cell projects here at Novo Nordisk, and today I'll tell you about upstream filtration of medias for ATMPs. But first, I will tell you about the three pillars of virus safety in traditional API production. Here we have the selection of the raw materials, testing of, of cell banks, non-process bulk, and finally virus clearance, evaluation of the purification process. And of course, we also had to avoid buildup and carryover in production through cleaning, sanitation, and physical segregation. The raw materials can be the cell culture media, the supplements, reagents, and containers, which all can be of animal origin or have been in contact with animal origin or non-animal derived. And traditionally for standard APIs, we will always choose the non-animal derived if possible. The manufacturing process, we also have some safeties where we test the master cell bank and the working cell bank and the unprocessed bulk for viruses. And we perform virus clearance evaluation of the purification process, proving that we are capable of removing virus. But for stem cells, it's quite a bit more difficult because the raw materials are often uh, derived from humans or animal origin or recombinant, and is quite often also research grade as the area is quite new, meaning they are not living up to the expectation from the authorities. Then we can, of course, test the cell banks for the stem cells, but we do not have an unprocessed bulk. So instead, we will test the final stem cell product for viruses or mycoplasma and sterility, of course. And finally, we can perform virus clearance evaluations as we don't have a purification process for the stem cells as they would be removed. Of course. So this means we have one of the safety pillars in, in the traditional API removed. So we have to substitute this. And that is by establishing virus barriers and operational procedures instead. I will illustrate this here where we have uh, the facility-specific virus control strategy has to be in place. 
we have to control the environment to make sure viruses don't get into our stem cells and establish procedures that that aim to avoid viruses. And then, of course, finally, we have to choose uh, raw materials and make sure they are uh, safe regarding virus. And if they are not, we have to put a virus barrier in place. And one of these raw materials we have been looking into is the cell culture mediums. They contains, uh, often contain human or animal or uh, recombinant uh, origin uh, raw materials. And they have proven quite difficult to filter uh, on many different filters. Um, but we have, we have found out that the Planoa BioE is, is quite capable of filtering medias, uh, which some of the other filters had uh, to give up on. And here I have illustrated two uh, blocks of uh, two different medias we are using in the stem cell productions. We have medium A and medium B here illustrated, where you see medium A has a quite traditional small flux decay and is behaving quite well, where we have medium B, which is quite difficult, where we have a high flux decay in the start and then it uh, flattens out a bit and get, becomes a bit more steady. If we do mass calculations on, on these meters, we, we uh, usually use a batch size of about 20 liters, which is sufficient for a production of, for example, a, a, a stem cell bank. And here we can see that medium A would approximately take a bit more than an hour to filter on a one square meter plan over by UX filter, where the medium B would take about twice as long to filter on a one square meter filter with the same batch volume. And this is performed at two bars. But if we compare two bar versus three bar for the uh, filtration of the medium uh, B, we actually see it doesn't make a difference really. So the flux decay is very similar for both two and three bars. And when we do the Vmax study uh, calculation, we actually see that 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 the process time is uh, completely the same, which is quite uh, surprising, but that's what we observe. Finally, we have tried to filter the media, pre-filter the media with a 0.1 uh, filter to see if we could remove some of the possible aggregate that might be in the media. And when we do this at three bars, uh, we actually don't see any difference. This suggesting that the aggregates might be smaller than 0 0.1 micrometer, or it's due to a large degree of adsorption to the filter uh, of components in the media. This means, of course, we have to perform both promotion tests of the filtered meter on our stem cells to make sure it's working after filtration. And for now, it seems it worked quite well still. So we are not quite sure what's actually being removed during the filtration. I have summed up the data here. And as mentioned, we don't really see a big difference in the filtration time of media B uh, with uh, different pressure or pre-filtration. However, if you notice that the last uh, row we have medium B with a 0 0.1 filter downstream of the BioEx filter. And why we have that is a, a longer story, but we, ex we see the process time increases a bit. And that's of course, because the uh, downstream steroid filter is providing a bit of back pressure to the virus filter. Finally, I would like to show you some virus clearance data from medium B on, um, on the BioEx filter. So here we have performed two run at three bars where we spiked medium B with power virus. And in the two runs, we obtain a log reduction value of 7.8 and 8.2 with a mean of eight. And this is very, very efficient in my opinion. And it's a lot higher than we had observed with some of the other filters pointing to that 
this BioEx filter is a very, very good filter for this purpose. So with these words, I'd like to say thank you for listening and I'm here to take some questions after the session. Thank you. As Dr. Thompson cannot join the live Q&A session, uh, we will be sure to forward any questions that you might have to him. But maybe I'll take this opportunity to ask you a question, Nathan. Uh, today, media treatment is seen more as a risk mitigation step. How do you see that evolving in the future? Do you think it will become a regulatory requirement? Wow, that's a good question. Um, no, I, like, I hope not. Um, I really think it's up to the responsibility of any manufacturer to do, to take a risk-based approach, right? To really understand their manufacturing process and really truly evaluate the risks and um, impose barrier filtration where it's necessary. So, you know, I think you have to, to really do your homework, really understand the, the process itself, what potential risks could come in. And then um, if it's warranted, yeah, you, you should be doing the right thing and, and imposing um, uh, barrier filtration if there's no way to have any other way to mitigate your, your risks, or if you find it's the best thing to, uh, for uh, you from a business perspective or from a patient's perspective. Okay, great. Thank you, Nathan. Well, the session is coming to a close now, so uh, I'll leave it up to you to give the final remarks and to introduce uh, Yamamoto-san. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank all three of our speakers this afternoon. It was uh, quite interesting to see the progress being made in the application of, um, um, uh, to, first of all, to understand uh, some of the science behind virus filtration again. I think there's uh, a lot more learnings we can do and uh, every little bit of work that's being done on this uh, gives us better insight as to how virus filters work and, um, and allows us then to, to utilize this information in order to maintain and increase the safety of our products. Um, the, also, the, the applications um, within uh, lentivirus and, and some of the ATMPs, I think this is also uh, a, a, a really the, the frontier for us. Um, I think there were some questions asked about you know, um, virus inactivation or virus removal within lentiviruses, and I think that's a kind of a whole, holy grail for that part of the industry, as well as cell-based therapies, you know, us looking for new novel technologies that we can use that uh, provide better assurance for our, uh, for our patients. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, again thank Asahi for inviting me to be a chair, and I would now like to introduce our final um, uh, speaker of this evening. It's uh, Dr. Yamamoto-san, who will um, close up and provide uh, closing remarks for us. Good afternoon. My name is Masashi Yamamoto. I am now technical director of Asahikase Bioprocess Europe, and I am based in Cologne, Germany. On behalf of Asahi, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you who attended 2021 Pranova EU Virtual Symposium. Of course, we prefer to be physically present to make this symposium, but the situation did not allow us. However, we really hope that we can make it possible next year. Despite the virtual style of this symposium, I think we had very good live discussions. I want to thank the speakers who made their presentations very interesting and could answer all questions from the audience as much as possible. Also, I would like to thank our great chairman for facilitating the sessions so well. There are four sessions in two days with a lot of information shared. And of course, I'll not be able to summarize everything here in a few minutes. However, I'd like to mention maybe some highlights that I could catch during all the talks. Yesterday, the first session of our symposium was dedicated to fundamentals and regulatory. We started with the hottest topic of the moment, which is COVID-19. 
As Dr. Cray said, the question is not if we will face in the future another similar pandemic, but when. And we will have to be better prepared this time. In the presentation of Dr. Brumel, we could see that the new revision of ICHQ5 is advancing very well. And we can expect its release in maybe two to three years. Dr. Rupak explained the need to adapt our risk mitigation strategy to the new personalized medicines and the new class of products. More automatic and online testing tools will be crucial in the near future, also with cell-based and gene therapy products. Dr. Bailey explained well that the virus safety step will have to be implemented at the very beginning of a process for raw materials and other media. In the second session, we also had several presentations related to plasma-derived proteins. Dr. Farrell demonstrated the importance to work in the famous case-by-case -case strategy to be able to optimize in the best way a virus removal step. Dr. Ugulaba showed the possibility to replace an old nanofilter of an existing commercial process with Planover 20N thanks to its remarkable robustness toward any manufacturing conditions. We ended the plasma session with Dr. Raiji, who presented a very interesting work to better understand the virus retention robustness of a nanofilter. It showed that many different parameters and mechanisms are in fact interplaying together that result in the final virus retention capacity of the nanofilter. Today, in the biomanufacturing session, we could see two very good, very good examples of how to use a non-GLP virus clearance study. In order to fix and verify that the operating conditions can lead to the expected virus reduction value. This is Kujine, uh, showed that Planova 20N was very robust despite freeze and slow feed solution, but also if there were process interruptions during product filtration and prior final buffer flush. Dr. Cooper could also check in a non-GLP virus clearance study that very high protein concentrations did not affect at all the virus detention of BioEx. The biomanufacturing session ended with a presentation of the Mrs. Helen, who showed a great overview of a continuous process for MAB production. We could see that such a process can bring very high productivity, but also requires a fine-tuned connection in between each process step, including several automations. In the last session of our symposium, we wanted to bring information on some new trends and technologies. Professor Nishizaka showed us impressive microscopic animated images, making virus removal filtration more real and concrete. It helps us in our understanding of the mechanisms involved. This is Moriera presented two new technologies. The first one is the lentivirus vector production for gene therapy, which is a very promising therapy for the near future already. And the second technology was related to our microfilter bioptimal, which can replace in only one single step both centrifugation and depth filtration. Finally, Dr. Thompson presented his work on advanced therapy medicinal products, ATMPS, and his strategy to nanofilter cell culture media with Planova Biorex, which was very successful. Now it is as a stand to show a new technology. I am very excited to introduce this to all of Planova family members. This is our new virus removal filter.
Asahi Kasei Bioprocess, the pioneer and industry leader in the field of hollow fiber membrane technology, launched its first virus removal filter as Planova in 1989. Since then, we have built 30 years of customer trust with virus removal filters. Asahi Kasei Bioprocess is pleased to introduce our cutting edge superior regenerated cellulose virus removal filter, Planova S20N, which provides next generation superiority with higher flux and throughput, robust virus removal capability over various process designs, while retaining the key advantages of the rest of the Planova filter lineup. Planova S20N improves operational efficiency during process scale-up and manufacturing, and requires only leakage test as the pre- and post-use integrity test. Planova S20N will be launched soon to the biopharmaceutical market. Again, thank you to everybody for all the very fruitful discussions. After you will leave the, this symposium, I hope you will remember that Asahikase Bioprocess does not only sell filters, but we offer more such as our technical support and high knowledge in filtration directly to you without any intermediates. We strongly believe in the direct and open relationship with our customers and please never forget that we are here to serve you anytime. As it is our tradition at the end of each Planova workshop, I'd like to finish my long closing remarks by announcing the date and place of the next year's Planova workshop. Depending, of course, of the COVID-19 situation, the workshop will be held in New York on October 6th to 7th, 2022, we are looking forward to seeing you again next year in New York. One last information, the virtual booth will be open until 6.30 p.m. Central European time, and our staff will be waiting for any kind of questions at each booth. So please visit our virtual booth exhibition hall. Thank you, and see you soon. <laughs>